This story is about a moment when the world changed forever. It involves disaster at sea and amazing feats of exploration. It all started with one man just over there in North Lincolnshire, but eventually it drew in the Royal Navy, the greatest minds in the land, and the King himself. And at the centre of it all was the clock. In this film, I'm going to discover how an amazing clock from North Lincolnshire changed the world, and how it's still changing the world. And like any modern driver, I'm using one of these to find it. After 300 yards, turn left. And there's a direct link between SatNav and the clock I'm about to visit. I'm incredibly excited by this. This clock was made by one of my all-time heroes, John Harrison. There are only two others like it in the whole world, and they're worth well over a million pounds each. You have reached your destination. Just here, this is um, oh. Precision Pendulum Clock Number 2 by John and James Harrison. That is wonderful. This is our object, Precision Pendulum Clock Number 2, made by the Harrison brothers, John and James, in 1727. The clock's signed by James, who may have made the case, but the brains was older brother John. They made it in Barrow on Humber. Harrison made just three of these clocks. They were incredibly accurate. To within a second a month. That's the accuracy that they, he achieved with the precision pendulum clocks. One second a month. One second a month was un unprecedented accuracy. They, they would have been the most accurate clocks in the world. He must have lain awake at night, mustn't he? dreaming about how to improve things. Yeah, I think he probably had a very one-tracked mind. <laughs> the most shocking thing about this clock is that the working bit, the movement, is made mainly from wood, not what you'd expect from the most accurate clock in the world. This is a big day for precision pendulum number two. We're going to make it tick. John Harrison became obsessed with incredibly accurate clocks to keep time not on land, but at sea. He lived close to the mighty River Humber, where he must have been aware of the stories the sailors brought back. This was the beginning of a great seafaring age. The British were pushing out across the oceans. The trouble was they had a real technical problem with navigation. Once they were out of sight of land, they had no idea where they were and they didn't have the technology to find out. Sailors learnt to navigate by measuring the height of the sun above the horizon using a sextant. Not that easy, despite the patient instruction of Lieutenant Johnny Bannister of the Royal Navy. So, if you look at the sun to start off with, yeah, yep. and then slowly move your right hand down um, and move your left hand as well oh, until, I the, see. until the sun touches the horizon. I've lost it. No, it's there. It's not easy, this, it's is not, it? No, no. Especially here in the boat rocking around. But even when you've got it right, measuring the height of the sun doesn't tell you where you are, only how far north of the equator. What use was it? I mean, you know your latitude, but you don't know where you are. Um, that's all you could work out. To find out how far east or west they were, sailors used dead reckoning. First, they had to measure their speed. Today, I'm on the Humber lifeboat, and when they aren't saving lives at sea, Dave Steenvorden and his crew are pretty handy with a log line. So Dave, what, you've got a baked bean tin, are you going fishing? We're, go, we're going fishing for speed. <laughs> and okay. At, and every 47 feet and three inches, we've got a mark on the line, which is one knot. Right. We're going to time it for 28 seconds. Okay. And at the 28 seconds, we'll know how many knots have actually gone out by the boat, and that represents the speed of the vessel. I'll believe it when I see it. So Steve's going to throw it over yeah. and get it all played out ready to its first mark. So where you go, Steve. OK. And he'll stop. That's the, that's the start. OK. So, so it's, it's now stable in the water. On my mark, Steve. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. One, two, three. Go. So she's going out freely now. Right. And if you watch the marks, Steve will count the marks. One. 
Two. This might look a bit basic. Three. But before John Harrison, thousands of sailors' Four. lives depended on getting this dead right. Five. Stop. Just less than six. What was the real answer? 5.4, that is amazing, really amazing. It's so simple, it works. It's it really the... works. I reckon it must be the quality of your baked beans. It's got to be. Like sailors in Harrison's time, Johnny is now get a plot our position. From the log, he knows our speed, and from the compass, our direction. Johnny's plotted our position by dead reckoning, but it's not where we are. Out here in the River Humber, uh, we've got lots of wind and lots of tide um, that actually affect us. Right, and we should have been there. So we should have been there. We measured our speed through the water all right, but unfortunately, the water itself was moving, thanks to the tide. Errors like this build up. On a long voyage, they can add up to a ship or even a whole fleet being way off course. Navigation at sea had always been a problem, but it came to public attention after a terrible disaster on the night of the 22nd of October, 1707. A fleet of five ships of the line was coming back from Gibraltar under the command of the Admiral of the Fleet, the splendidly named Sir Cloudsley Shovel. Unfortunately, they made a navigational error and they sailed absolutely smack into the Scilly Islands. Four ships went down, including the Admiral's flagship, the Association, 2,000 men drowned and the Admiral himself was thrown up on the beach half alive and murdered for the ring on his finger. This was a truly national disaster and people realised that something had got to be done. So in 1714 the government launched the Longitude Act with a prize of up to £20,000, that's several million in today's money, for anyone who could come up with a way to find a ship's position at sea. John Harrison thought he could do it with a clock. Imagine you were a sailor in John Harrison's day, sailing from England west towards America. Now you've been gone for a week or something, you're somewhere out in the middle of the Atlantic, and you can tell what time it is where you are because you watch until the sun is at its highest point in the sky, and that's noon, 12 noon. But you don't know where you are. However, suppose you've taken a clock with you and the clock is set to English time, and it says three in the afternoon, then it's quite clear that you're three hours behind England. The Earth takes 24 hours to turn all the way round, and so clearly three hours behind puts you exactly there. So you can pinpoint your position using a clock set to English time. But there was a problem. To be more accurate than the old ways, this would need a clock 50 times more precise than any previous yeah. clock. Matthew Reed is a clock expert who knows all about John Harrison's wooden clocks. He's come along to get precision pendulum number two ticking again, but he's got to be careful. That's our striking weight on. It's over 280 years old, um, and the weights that drive the clock could cause severe damage. Once it's going, it's absolutely beautiful. John Harrison seems to have made this clock in direct response to the longitude challenge. The design is unique, but very complicated. Was he being over uh, clever? Well, considering that the, a contemporary clock, maybe by George Graham, would have kept time to within a handful of seconds a week, and Harrison was claiming a second a month, then you could argue that, in okay. fact, he wasn't being okay. overly... Uh, right. Again, going back to the longitude problem, the Achilles heel of all clocks, and especially in the 18th century, was the lubrication. And Harrison knew that if you wanted a clock to run reliably and consistently at sea, if you could make something that had no added lubrication, then you would have solved that problem. John Harrison was clearly an unusual man. I decided that the only way to get into his mind was to follow in his footsteps and to make my own wooden clock. I have to confess I've become a bit obsessed with bodging, making things from freshly cut wood using very basic tools. This is my shave horse. And here
Here is my wonderful homemade pole lathe, powered by a bent sapling. OK, I admit I've cheated slightly here, but then I haven't got quite as much time as John Harrison had. A clock has basically three components. The first is a wheel, which is going to spin round like this one. The second is a power source, and I'm going to hang on a piece of string this weight, which will pull the wheel round as it falls. And then we need a time regulator, and I'm going to use a pendulum, and that's going to swing on this nail. The top is a bit of oak, and then there's this long piece of ash, and a weight on the end. And because it's one metre long, it will take one second to go from one side of the swing to the other. So that's going to be my time regulator. Now, I'm going to move that back until the pallets, these points here, are just between the cogs of my escape wheel. It should allow one cog to escape on each swing of the pendulum. Let's just try it and see. Fantastic! This is how John Harrison's clocks worked. Now I also need to measure how much time has gone by. So I'll just stop it for a sec and I'll add this extra wheel here. So if I connect the two with a rubber band like this, this big wheel with its hand on it should turn around in exactly a minute. Harrison's clocks were amazingly accurate, something like one second a day. Mine, well, I need a little bit more practice, I think, but I have made a clock out of wood. John Harrison was certainly a better craftsman than I am, but his early clocks had a rather similar design. And after all, if you were making a clock for a stately home, it probably didn't matter whether it was all that accurate. But something changed in John Harrison. He decided that it did matter how accurate his clocks were and thought he knew how to make them much, much better. He got his chance probably about 1720 when he was commissioned to make a clock for the Brocklesby Park Estate in North Lincolnshire. The big house here was owned by the Earl of Yarborough who wanted a clock for his stable. The building's still used as a stable, and the clock is still there. Wow, this is it. That is a beautiful clock. Just look at the carving of the minutes on the dial now. This is oak, this is brass, but almost the whole thing is made of wood. And the extraordinary thing is that it's been running practically continuously for almost 300 years. Now, you're the chap who winds this, yes? I am that. Yeah, how often? We do it once a week. Can we take the case off and get a better look? We can, that, do we? Right, how do we do that? Helping me get inside the clock is Richard Johnson, right. the Brocklesby estate joiner. I thought he looked a bit familiar. Then I realised that when I visited okay, the clock 20 years ago, I'd met Richard's dad when he used to look after the clock. Do you need to take all this off to wind? He did it for 40 odd years then. 40 years? Yeah. And how long have you been doing it? Um, I've been doing it for about five years now. You've got some way to go then. <laughs> yeah. You say you wind it once a week. Could I have a go at winding it now? You can. Right. Oh. When he first built it, this was a completely conventional clock. And, like most clocks of the time, it didn't work very well. He was always coming back to fix it. Things kept sticking. He oiled them, but in the bitter Lincolnshire climate, the oil thickened and gummed everything up. So he threw out the sticky parts and came up with entirely new designs. The most obvious innovation is this beautiful thing, the grasshopper escapement. Instead of the wood rubbing against the brass, it releases it cleanly. And where things did have to rub, he used an amazing new material, a dark wood from Africa called lignum vitae. Lignum vitae is a very oily wood and uh, it's done really to self-lubricate. 
You mean you don't need toilet? No, there's no lubrication on this needed. Never? No. In 300 years? No. That is extraordinary. It is. But there was a surprising twist to the tale. Not only was the new clock maintenance free, it was incredibly accurate. No longer losing a minute a day, it now lost much less than a minute a week. What an amazing clock. No oil, no friction, and no problems for 300 years. The extraordinary claim made for John Harrison is that he built the most accurate clock in the world and then used it to help mariners find their position at sea, which was one of the great problems of the age. This would have been pretty extraordinary if he'd been a grand scientist living in London and armed with all the latest precision equipment. But in fact, he was a humble joiner who lived and worked here in the village of Barrow on Humber. John was born in West Yorkshire, but the family moved here when he was a young lad, and it was here in Barrow that he and his younger brother James set up their business. There aren't many relics of the Harrisons left in Barrow, but one of them is this sundial. And if you look at it, it says 1732 something church. It might be Holy Trinity Church. And they made it and presented it to the church. And look at the time. The shadow points to 1x, 9 o'clock. It's absolutely spot on. Perfect timekeeping. There really isn't much more of John Harrison in Barrow. Local knowledge says that this pub car park wall was once John's workshop. If that's right, I'm standing in the very spot where he built not only the Leeds clock, but the first of his great marine timekeepers. Later, he moved into a combined house and workshop up the road. Sadly, the house itself has now gone, but there is a much older house opposite. And John said he set his clocks by timing when particular stars disappeared behind his neighbour's chimney. Matthew, you've been having fun here, haven't you? You've taken the whole thing to bits. I have, yeah, great fun. <laughs> really? Yeah. Was it easy? Uh, yes, it was. It follows the pattern of any 18th century long case clock in the vast majority of parts. Right. Yeah. And, and putting it back together? Yeah, just a question of time, really. It can only fit together in one order. It's even, all even I couldn't get it? Even you could fit it together, <laughs> um, give, given enough it. time. Yeah, I might take some more. Now, million dollar question. Yes. Why did he build this clock? Well, by the mid-1720s, um, he was actively seeking the longitude prize, the cash prize to find longitude at sea. And um, in these clocks, uh, he tried to develop systems that could be used later in his marine timekeepers. And they were temperature compensation right. and the ability to run without lubrication. He'd solved the lubrication problem in the Brocklesby Park clock. But to make clocks that would work in all temperatures, he turned the house in Barrow into a lab. So you mean he actually put one in a hot room and one in a cold room? He did, yes. Yeah, absolutely. He would build up the fire in one room and uh, have the other one maybe, I don't know, in a north facing room or something, right. and then swap them around. Right, so what was he testing there? What was he trying Temperature to? compensation. Okay. A, a marine timekeeper, any timekeeper in fact, uh, before Harrison would run slow in heat and fast in cold and uh, he wanted to eliminate that problem okay. in order to win the longitude prize. Matthew hasn't taken the clock apart just for fun. They want to find out how John Harrison made his amazing wooden gear wheels. So they brought them to the Royal Armouries in Leeds where they can take a look inside. The great wheel from the Leeds clock is actually made of many separate pieces of oak of different sorts and an X-ray may reveal what John Harrison was up to. The X-ray shows a master at work, mixing fast-growing and slow-growing oak and lining up the grain for maximum strength. Matthew has also brought along a new toy. It looks like a ray gun, and that's pretty much what it is, firing X-rays at the surface decoration on the clock to find out what it's made of. It's faded now, but the case may have been decorated with gold and silver leaf. At one time, this sort of testing used to mean sending the piece away. Now, you get a result in seconds. We were obviously on a piece that was originally silver leaf, and we're picking up areas of gold, which would have been gold leaf. It was probably decorated to make it more saleable. Once he'd used it, John sold Precision Pendulum Number 2 to raise funds for further research. 
The Longitude Prize was to be awarded by a board of longitude, which included the Astronomer Royal. Here is where Harrison had to present his clock. This is the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, built in 1675, and one of its main functions is the accurate measurement of time. Today, the time galleries at Greenwich are a shrine to the amazing clocks John Harrison made to attack the longitude problem. Even though Precision Pendulum No. 2 was the best clock in the world, it was not going to win the prize. No matter how good his clock was, a swinging pendulum was never going to work on a ship at sea. Working away in Barrow and Humber, this is what he came up with. And you can see that the pendulum has gone completely. It's been replaced by these arms that swing out and in. And this motion was designed to cope with the awful rocking of a ship at sea. The board agreed to a sea trial. Harrison and the clock were sent on a return trip to Lisbon. He got horribly seasick. His clock was a bit erratic on the way out, but easily beat the ship's navigators on the way home. It was good, but not conclusive. He moved to London, eventually here to Red Lion Square in Hoban, where he spent the rest of his life pursuing the prize. In London, he made a second and then a third great marine timekeeper. It was a radical new design. Unfortunately, he could not get it quite right and he went on fiddling and tinkering with it for 19 years. But in the 1750s, Harrison, now a professional clockmaker, got interested in watches. They were not great timekeepers. Losing a minute a day was considered good. But being John Harrison, he went back to basics and radically rethought the way watches were made. Finally, aged 67, he presented the Board of Longitude with this, his solution to the problem, H4. H4 was the result of Harrison's life work and a brilliant timekeeper. But the Board of Longitude said that it did not meet the conditions for the prize. They insisted that copies of H4 should be made and tested so that there would be timekeepers for the entire Navy. In 1772, a copy of H4 was given to Captain James Cook, who took it on his second and third great voyages. Cook was won over, calling the watch our never-failing friend. But the board wouldn't agree that the trial was over. Luckily, the king, George III, was a great fan of these marine timekeepers and even had them tested in his own observatory. He heard that Harrison and the Board of Longitude had fallen out and he personally intervened and said that enough was enough and Harrison should get the money. Well, eventually they did pay him some when he was 80 years old and he died three years later. At the end of the road, turn right. John Harrison solved the longitude problem over 200 years ahead. ago, but his idea of using time to find where you are lives on. I've been using my satellite navigation system to find my way around. And there's a direct link between John Harrison and SatNav. It also uses incredibly precise clocks to pinpoint your position on Earth. You have reached your destination. To show you how it works, I need some nautical help. So I've recruited the boys at Hull Trinity House School, which has been preparing lads to go to sea since the 18th century. Satellite navigation involves sending clocks into space. Those clocks are accurate to within one second in a million years. I wonder if even John Harrison would have believed such a thing was possible. I've set up my own sat-nav system. I want to find out my position in this vast ocean. I've set up three satellites manned by students from Hull Trinity. They're slightly low tech. Each one has a loudspeaker and a mobile phone connected to the speaking clock. Now, what I'm doing 
is watching my clock here, which is synchronized with the speaking clock. And when it comes up to a particular time, 10 seconds, I press my stopwatch and I listen for the speaking clock over there. And when I hear the third pip, I press it again and look for the difference between the two. The sound from each station takes a while to reach me. The further away, the longer it takes. Now, from station A over there, the difference was 0.64 of a second, and from station B over there, the difference was 1.68 of a second, so it's obviously much further away. Now, what we need now is station C. In real sat-nav, the signal travels at the speed of light, but I don't think I could work my stopwatch quite quickly enough for that. 1.36 for C. So I've now got the delays from all three stations. For A, it's 0.64 of a second, and that means I should have been somewhere on that arc there. Station B was 1.68, and so I must have been somewhere in this arc here. So probably I was where these points cross, but as a check I can do station C, and they were about here. So I'll take the third arc, and the result is I must have been somewhere within that triangle there. So that gives me a, a small area in which I know I am. But that's how GPS works, by taking the time from three different satellites, they can pinpoint your position in your car, and I can do it on a boat frozen in the middle of a lake. John Harrison started his quest to build the most accurate clock in the world because it would help to save lives at sea. Today, clocks are still saving lives at sea. So, Dave, tell me how you know where we are and where we're going. Well, straight away I know where we are because we've got the GPS. Oh, this is GPS? Yeah, it's, that's GPS. Telling us our position it's, down to, what, a millimetre? Well, you can see it's to one thousandth of a mile, and, yeah. it, and it's updating all the time. It's mm. constantly updating. Amazing. GPS has then put us on the chart. You can see the boat on the chart. So this is an electronic chart? Electronic chart, and it's Carrying live. Oh, Everything on its nose. That's, that's us live. Before John Harrison, navigation was so inaccurate that ships frequently hit rocks and many lives were lost. Today, thanks to Harrison's ideas, Dave and his crew have a permanent readout of exactly where they are. I love this machine. It may look just like a, an old grandfather clock, but I've had the privilege of getting under its skin, seeing how it ticks, and unravelling the stories both of Precision Pendulum No. 2 and of its maker, John Longitude Harrison. What's really amazing is that Harrison's big ideas are still making waves today. Precision Pendulum No. 2, made in Barrow on Humber in North Lincolnshire, really did change the world. If you have an object which shows what the people and places in the UK have given the world, then you can add it to our digital museum. To find out more, go to bbc.co.uk slash a history of the world.